The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of Kevin Jordan or his guests. These gardening tips and suggestions may work for you, as well as those from alternative sources. When using any garden products or tools, read and follow all label directions. And learn how to make your yard summer strong at BeWaterSmart.info. The Green Acres Garden Podcast is the podcast dedicated to helping gardeners hone their growing skills while we celebrate our love of plants. So whether you're new to growing or a seasoned gardener, you're sure to learn something new. Join the fun as we have conversations with world-class growers, passionate green thumbs, and professional garden experts from Green Acres Nursery and Supply. Listen every week. We'll answer questions you didn't know you had. And away we grow. Hello, everyone. Welcome one and all to the show. This is the Green Acres Garden Podcast. My name is Kevin Jordan, the cultivator kid himself, back in studio to have a great episode with you. We got a family episode this week. We're in-house, going to have a great conversation with my garden brother, Austin Blank. How's it going there, Austin? Hello, Kevin, and welcome back to all of our listeners. Let's go ahead and jump into another great show. Well, we have a great episode. We're going to be discussing you know, a lot of different things that you can still be doing in July if you want to, uh, although some of them we probably still have to if you got a garden going. I know it's been super hot. Everyone won't shut up about how hot it is, <laughs> me included. But it's true. It's so hot. It's uh, been scorching. We've had a bit of a heat wave, uh, over 105, 110, 115. It's been brutal. Um, for the last few weeks, garden is still standing. I was at the school garden this morning. It's looking good. Nice. I just had to get, got, uh, got the hula ho out, got a few weeds that were popping up, not very many, did an extra deep watering just to make sure. But uh, everything's looking good. The tomatoes are firing on all cylinders. I'm seeing a little bit of sun scorch. I know that you've been dealing with that a little well, bit. Yeah, you came over here and I was like, I got to show Kevin this. My tomatoes, I thought it was a burn. You called it a sun scald. Yeah. Same thing. Right? Yeah. Tomato, tomato. And uh, on your, you got burn on your tomato. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, a yeah, it's got patches that are facing the sun on the Absolutely. fruit. And you said to, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. This, that's why uh, Justin was throwing up his shade cloth because right. he had all those valuable tomatoes. He didn't want them getting sun scold. Um, it happens. You'll see a lot with bell peppers. The tomatoes will show it too. Like I said, I had a few in my garden that showed it. Luckily, um, we have enough shade leaves kind of around. That's why it's kind of important not to completely go, you know, go you know, wild on pruning sometimes. It's nice to have, you know, some shade leaves in there to protect. But uh, sun scold's common. It's going to happen. You can still cut those off. Remove that part that looks a little damaged, and you can eat what's what's uh, behind it, and hopefully still enjoy it. So it's part. Once we get over 100 degrees, you're going to see that, unfortunately. So if you see it, not the end of the world, but something to consider. Yeah. Um. So I've been noticing that a little bit, but uh, the garden is ripping, and so even with all this heat, you know, we're a positive podcast. I I would like to say we got good vibes here. I think so. So we are just going to roll with the optimism. But before we get into today's topic, man, I've got to share something with so you. So you went on a trip. I did. I don't go on too many trips, but I got to go on one. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I flew out to uh, Salt Lake City, the uh, Utah, the Beehive State. I've never been. What's it like? It was awesome, actually. Uh, it was warm, but not. it was like 90 in like the early, like low 90s. So it was not the, that hot compared to here. All the other teachers there were sweating it out. So what I went to <laughs> was... Put on by the National Agriculture in the Classroom. It was a convention, their 2024 convention. So hundreds of teachers, educators, um, administrators. From across the states. From all across the That's country cool. uh, came and collected. I got to meet so many incredible people. I passed out as many podcast cards oh, as I possibly could carry. Uh, I had to have a whole new uh, carry-on bag just for those. <laughs> uh, but I met so many new friends, uh, c- c- connected with some really brilliant educators, too, who were putting on some really wild um, little trainings for people, everything from beehives at school. I think I'm fired Ooh. up. I know we had our, had our buddy Tim on a few weeks back. I loved Tim's episode. And that was we fun. love bees, and we love Tim. And so I was already kind of, like, juiced on it. I've been wanting to do this at the school for a while. Are you going to do it? And finally, Yeah. I, there was this lady there who uh, worked at this elementary school, I think in, like, Alabama or Georgia, and she was showing us these pictures of, her, of this little elementary school with her little fourth, fifth, sixth graders all dudded up in their bee suits. Oh, and so cool. they have they have hives. They've got little fencing around it. But the kids put on bee suits, and they're all safe. 
and they get to work the bees and no learn way. about all of it. And they're like, they're so young and it was so cute seeing these little kids all fired up. And she was telling stories about how, you know, one, there's always one student who's like really apprehensive and shy, especially to something like that with Naturally, bees. Naturally, yeah, of course. And then w- before too long, that student was like hands on <laughs> into the hive covered in bees and then teaching other smaller children what, what she, it was awesome. And so just, I was so fired up. So things like that, I got to, there was this professor there, uh, Professor Bechtel from Wartburg College. I think he's out in Iowa. Brilliant guy, so funny. He had the whole room wrapped around his finger because he was so hilarious. He was talking about DIY aquaponics for kids to learn. That's kind of what you do. It is. What, what we do is like a little bit more sophisticated where you got to have the pumps and the lights. Right. And it, so it takes a bit more uh, investment. What I loved about what he was doing was like it was aquaponics systems for kids and families starting with like empty pickle jars and Cheetos containers, you know, big plastic containers that we uh, wow. usually toss out or glass and you just take them, repurpose them, clean them up, throw some gravel in there, uh, you know, dechlorinate your water by letting it sit out and then you, just, you get cheap little fish and you just put one or two tiny little fish in there and then you experiment with all types of different plants and he was kind of like very humble, like, oh, I don't know with the kids and just let's, let's just try something. And so just seeing that and uh, it was really cool uh, what you can do. And the last one I'm going to share, there was this professor there, Dr. Craig Wilson. He directs the National USDA Future Scientist Program. And what he was discussing is how polystyrene, all the like unbiodegradable uh, styrofoam yeah, containers and cups, all the things we get our fast food in and whatnot – uh, usually it would just sit around landfills, not breaking down, or, or at least breaking down very, very slowly. Um, it would be in there forever. And so he, people found out that you can actually feed it to mealworms, which are the larvae of like darkling beetles. And so these mealworms, and he showed me cups and containers where you could see the holes and all the chew marks. And what happens is they actually eat it and whatever's going, there's magic going on in that gut. Talk about probiotics. They actually can digest that styrofoam. And when it comes out the other end, it's rendered harmless. And so all their frass is broken down styrofoam that is just ready to go back no into nature. Uh, pretty cool. And then, then you can feed those mealworms to chickens or so, whatever. Wow, that is cool. Did you say polystyrene or polystyrene. styrofoam? Is that styrofoam? Yeah, I think styrofoam is another name for it. Oh, okay. But polystyrene. So the white, yeah. Terrible All, all those stuff. white styrofoam containers and cups. Gotcha. Those single-use things that we use. They're, they're very convenient at the time and probably cheap to create, but they were, you know, they're filling up landfills and whatnot, and they're just, it's not a great thing. And so seeing that, and he was so fired, he reminded me of Baldo, because he was so passionate. He travels around to all the different states working with uh, agriculturalists. He was actually, he said, oh, I come out to Fresno all the time and work with, he actually was wanting to hook us up with someone to talk about grape. They were uh, hybridizing different grape varieties, and so he was all excited about that as well. But uh, it was people like that who were putting on these trainings for all these educators. It was just so inspiring. I learned so much. Just got to interact with so many cool people. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Got got a little FaceTime with some folks and got to go on stage and get my picture taken a little bit. because oh, cool. Because I was a guest because I was actually uh, there uh, on behalf of California Agriculture in the Classroom. I'm, I'm their Educator of the Year for 2024. So for me, it was a huge honor. I mean, it's only taken 15 years and tons of hours yeah. and dedication. I finally, finally made it there, and but it was so worth it. Um, it was a, just a, a total blast, and I, I loved every second of it. It was wow. really cool, beautiful place. Well, thanks for sharing that. It's an honor that we have you on this show, and you get to go out and do that and explore and come back and bring back your garden knowledge. So thank you. Well, in, to me, it really the agriculture part and the gardening for us, it's all connected. And the whole part of that was to try to get people excited about plants and animals and agriculture and how how important it is to our lives. And so to get young people from elementary, middle school, and high school uh, excited about that, knowledgeable about it, uh, it's something that I'm super passionate about. And so what we do here, I think, is a tiny piece of that puzzle. Well, Austin, can I give them a shout out? Of course. I And I can link to their website. Awesome. So okay. what is it? So the national uh, website uh, is aginthaclassroom.org, and that's the National Agriculture in the Classroom. Really cool stuff. Our, our own state one that I'm connected with, and shout out to them. They're a great team. California Foundation for Agriculture in the Classroom. That's learnaboutag.org. 
Uh, they have lessons plans, educational materials, and resources. You know, it's designed to kind of support educators bringing ag in the classroom. But even for parents or aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas or anybody who wants to inspire uh, the young people around them to kind of get uh, interested about agriculture and where their food comes from, uh, it's a great place to kind of start. I love it. And the people there are just so passionate and enthusiastic uh, about what they do, and it's, it's infectious. And so I just I owe them a huge, huge debt. Okay, wow. Well, thank you for sharing that, Kevin, and I encourage everyone to go check that out. I'll go ahead and put those links in the episode description. Um, all right, so, man, we are just firing on oh, all yeah. cylinders Buzzing, here, Kevin. baby, like a um, bee. <laughs> I want to get into some recommendations for our listeners this week. It's We've already you know, kind of brought it up. It's super, super hot, and I want to know what we should do in our gardens this week, what we should be looking for. Um, and kind of your general advice for right now. Okay, great. So July gardening, uh, there's so much you can do still, but just really just be consistent. So for me, it's continuing to harvest consistently. So like I said, I was in the garden this morning. I definitely would recommend doing it early and often if you can. It makes it a little bit easier. Before it gets hotter later in the day. You don't want to work out in the uh, peak heat of the day. I was out there seven this morning getting after it, and it made it so much better. I was out of the garden by like 9, 30, 10, Got so much done, and it was well worth it. By the time I was getting out of there, it was uh, getting hot. My straw hat was starting to spark. So uh, it was good. So just get out there early. But really, harvesting (laughs) is an easy thing. And so whether it's pinching back your basil, um, my basil's going wild. I mean, I couldn't even pinch any. I had to just cut them back real hard, some of them. I'm I'm beyond pinching. But if you're consistent, (laughs) the pinching is really helpful because you really want to induce lots of lush, healthy leaves on those herbs. But when it comes uh, to things like your cucumbers, uh, your squash, zucchinis, uh, your tomatoes, it's good to get to them nice and early and often so that way uh, you actually can get to the fruit before it gets overripe. So have you heard of the breaker stage, buddy? Um, I know. Is that a breakdancing move? Like, I will, what is this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no. So the breaker stage, and there's a little controversy there because some gardeners really love to just wait, let that, that tomato get vine ripe, right? I won't go out, you know, some people won't go out until it's, you know, it's blood red or Well, that's whatever. how that's, they sell them in the store, right? For that's sure. the marketing behind and tomatoes. That, and that's f- absolutely fine if um, that is working for you. But sometimes when things are getting really hot right now or you have pressure from, say, birds or rodents or whatever out have you, sometimes there is an advantage to getting to your tomatoes just a little early. So I actually brought you an example. Okay, what do we got this here? This is a beautiful uh, pink Berkeley tie-dye, a wild Let's boar favorite. This. And that, was, that one's great. It's not at its full color, but you can see how the color, the uh, the pink hue, has made it all the way around the tomato, even yep. to the blossom end. So um, it's starting to kind of turn. It's, it's breaking. And what's gonna, what's nice about that is that tomato has everything that it needs physiologically to kind of finish ripening, even off the vine a little bit. Really? So if you want to let that rest for a few days, or if you say you, you want to go travel and send that to a family member... Now, now it can actually travel a little bit and not be mush by the time it gets there. And you're saying the the indication that it's reached this stage is that the color has of... made it all the way to the blossom end, the bottom. God, yeah, it. absolutely. So with a traditional just red tomato, you'll you'll see it start to turn from green to kind of a light pink. So once it gets that 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 true pink and it makes it all the way down to the bottom of the tomato. You're safe to kind of snip it off if you want okay. and let it rest for a day or two. And it, you kind and of it will experiment. continue to change color. It will. You'll see it develop vine. and get a bit darker and darker and darker. And now, then you'll uh, you'll get it ready to, to rock. But I've if, got to bring up, though, this tomato's got a lot of splitting on it. That's actually that's, that's a great uh, point. So that's not, con- that's not an indicator of anything either. It's just hot. They're growing. And yep. the, the skin can't. It's, it's like me at a buffet if I was wearing spandex. <laughs> There's right. Something's got to give. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, ju- so they're very similar. So another reason why some people might argue, hey, the, the, get it at the breaker stage. Because if I left that on the, the vine a little bit longer yeah. and the heat kind of continues and it has a rough day, those splits may widen, deepen. And it, and it might become more vulnerable to pests, insects, Got or just it. premature rotting. And so something, uh, another, that's another example of why you might want to get it at that breaker stage. Cool. Uh, so that's something to consider. Can I ask you, too? I've also heard of, of putting the tomatoes in a paper bag and some kind of, I don't know if it's a chemical reaction or something happens where they 
ripen? Is is this the You'll same? You'll see thing? that with fruit. I think it's uh, the, if their fruits create their own like uh, is it ethylene gas they they, they, they off gas and that kind of okay. helps speed up the ripening so you'll see people do that with with fruits right and it speeds it up i think it does okay. yeah because you're trapping in some of that gas and that uh, god i got we had to do the research on that okay sure but i think that has something to do with it for sure um go for it because uh sometimes those paper bags are nice you're going to keep out little flies and things okay uh, and then you can just make sure you reach in there. Don't forget about it. Oh, sure. Because that one's good, buddy. I brought that okay. for you. You can keep that. Really? Yeah, yeah. Thank I you. was going to so, charge, charge you 10 bucks, but it's cool. <laughs> so you think uh, a couple days and it's ready to go? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, I mean, if, you're, if, you, if you were hungry, you could eat it right now. But I'm telling you, if you, get, if you just let that thing sit on the counter for a day or two, oh, buddy. And this is a pink Berkeley tie-dye. Oh, that's one of my favorites. Dude, I don't think I've had this since we tried these like a couple years ago in your garden. They're meaty. And, and I got to try a little bit, and I loved it. Yeah, the, the flesh is inside. incredible. Thank I have another you. tomato I wanted to bring up, but okay. I'll have, maybe I'll have to bring it in next week. I saw one on the vine, and it wasn't past the breaker stage yet, or else I would have brought it in. I, I, I nicknamed it the monster. It's this big. This <laughs> tomato on this on this uh, plant is so big. I think it's going to break my own personal rec. It's going to be uh, over three pounds. Whoa. The thing's huge, dude. It looks like a melon, my bud. Um, it's bigger than my child's head and I'm talking about my oldest child. Uh, it's, it's big. And so I've got some monsters out there. They're looking good. Even all the little cherries, nice. um, are coming along. So I've been eating my sun gold. Love that. I've yeah, been sharing them candy. with my family. They're eating them up, telling me they like them and they're sweet. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's been successful. I harvested a few handfuls today. Just boop, 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 boop. And, uh, same thing. I noticed if I wait too long, the ones, if I'm getting to some that are, that have been sitting, you know, for a couple days later, they're, they're already soft. Right. Like too soft, right? And I like them a, a little firm, a little taunt. Uh, and so it's good to kind of, even for those, you can kind of get them a little bit early. But uh, it's, man, it's, it's even with the heat. And I haven't thrown up any shade cloth. I know a lot of folks, you know, are, are utilizing that. And that really helps with that sun scold. But at the school garden, that's not really an option for us right now. Dude, I'll, I have a few tomatoes with a bit of sun scorch. For the most part, they're all looking really good. Wow, that's good. So unfortunate. Good yeah. for you. And that's because you've tightly packed. Yeah, we got rows. They're shading yeah, each yeah, other. Yeah, they're kind of shading each other, and uh, just the way that the, the sunlight kind of hits our garden, and just I think we're just getting okay. getting good luck. Well, I out wonder there. what I should do with mine because I've got them out there, and maybe it's just I just you're doing good. It. Just keep doing. Yeah, just they're in a spot where it's hot. They're against that fence. You're probably getting yeah. reflected heat. You got concrete as well. Um, well, they're raised up off that. I know, but it's just that that reflected yeah. heat is okay. rough, and so it's just it's just hot. I think once things cool down a little bit, if they do, um, that'll help. But just I've seen your tomatoes, bud. You're doing a great job. Okay, thank you. Um, especially since they're all in containers, which yeah. actually brings me to my next topic. Okay, what's that? It's just watering. Okay. Um, July watering, you may have to change a little bit, but it doesn't mean those changes need to be completely drastic. If what you've been doing has been working, you can kind of continue as on. But like I said, we've been having some extended kind of heat. Uh, so for me, I've had to kind of go a little bit longer, just a little bit deeper just to account for that. But I would say don't go crazy on it because I've noticed you can actually kill a plant from overwatering just as well as under. Sure. So uh, when you overwater, you're pushing out uh, the oxygen out of those poor spaces in the soil. The roots, they're having a hard time breathing. So it's really important. Just give them a good deep saturation, but check your soil too. If it's already wet and soggy, you probably don't need to water again. But when it comes to your containers, you're probably going to notice you may have to really uptick your watering and maybe even your feeding like we brought up in the past. Containers tend to tend to drink that water out and drain a little bit faster than in-ground, and they uh, they also lose their nutrition a bit quicker. So if this might be a time to do, do a light top dressing with some earthworm castings or a light organic fertilizer if you're in containers. Uh, but for the most part, my in-ground beds, they're looking pretty good, so I'm not too worried about it. So uh, just adjust watering as needed. I've even seen people putting up pictures of like their succulents looking beat up. They're like, "Why is my aeonium all cupped up with the leaves instead of being flat like really? a?" Really? Yeah, like uh, they're, they're just cupping up, and it's just they're curling. It's the heat. It's uh, watering. So make sure those are even getting uh, the water they need. And sometimes plants just react to the heat. Sure. And no matter, even if you're giving them sufficient water, like I have Japanese maple, it is looking a little bit rough. It's fine that it's alive, but just the amount of sunlight it gets is a little bit too much. Uh, but the water, they're still getting water. So just know that even if you see damage, it doesn't mean you're doing anything completely wrong. Uh, it just means right. it, it might be hot. So we, I guess the pro, you, you want to avoid is there's signs of heat stress. 
you're worried that you're underwatering, and then you go too far, and then you overwater. Yes. Right. So yeah, T- take it easy. Just give <laughs> okay. them give them water as needed. But really, I just check dig, the soil. dig down, check your soil, the finger test, the uh, you know, dig down with with a um, soil probe if you had, or even a screwdriver or a little trowel. You can figure out how how deep that water is actually making it. So that's helpful. That was the first thing you did when I said, "Look at my tomatoes." You went over there, pushed the mulch oh, away, yeah. and stuck your finger in there, and you're like, "Yep." But this needs a little more water. <laughs> I could just move the pot and go, ooh, it should be heavier. Okay. You know? And it was, luckily for you, it wasn't like light as air. I've done that before. I picked up a container like, ooh, ooh. whoa, this has no water in it. Uh, woo. Uh, it's almost, it almost floated away. Yeah. Yeah, all my stuff's on twice a day right now. It, your stuff looks good. Given, given how hot it's been, yours looks good. All right. Thank you, Kevin. You're making me feel so much better when you give me these compliments about my, Dude, my garden. you learn fast. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah. You're, it's you're all because of you, bud. Oh, pff, you're too kind. So um, anything else you want to point out that we should be thinking about? Well, as you're out there harvesting and you're clipping and you're, uh, you're checking on your irrigation, um, just be sure to kind of keep a lookout for those pests. As, as the pl- plants get stressed, that's when they become a little bit more vulnerable to all those those bugs out there, the aphids and whatnot. So I've been noticing I kind of keep my ear to the ground on the online forums for our area. People are getting those leaf-footed bugs a lot. They're, I'm seeing some harlequin bugs and you know beetles on their cucumbers. So just keep an eye out for those bad bugs. A lot of them can be dealt with really easy. We look with the, the, the soapy bucket method where you can just scrape them off right into a little soapy bucket. Um, some you can spray if you need to, but for the most part, just keep an eye out. Document what you have, and then you can look online to see, is that a, is that a foe or a friend? Uh, and if they, get those foes out of there. Uh, but don't drink, no, same thing with the watering. Don't have an overreaction. Just collect them, uh, kill them as you need, as you need to, but you don't have to go out and spend a bunch of money on some harsh chemicals. Just make sure it's targeted to whatever creature you are dealing with. Be very specific. Got it. Okay, love that. Now, the last thing I'm going to discuss is something that you probably don't want to do in this heat, um, because it's just hot, so get out there early in the morning. But this is something I'm going to have to do later this week because when I was walking my garden uh, at the school this morning, I noticed our fruit trees were getting huge. Uh, I pruned them a bunch and cleared out their, their centers, created a nice canopy and scaffolding over the winter, uh, and they've grown, and some have produced already some bountiful harvest. I mean, we pulled off some super sweet, delicious peaches and nectarines already, but we have other varieties that are still producing as well, the, the plums and the pluots, the apriums. It's been a really killer year. But the trees are getting so tall, they're getting kind of out of range for what we want with our students, especially when it comes to the backyard orchard. Um, you really ni- it's really nice for people to bring down that, that canopy into a size that's manageable. We don't need thousands and thousands of uh, pounds of fruit per tree. We, we do want healthy fruit and a healthy tree and one that's kind of easily reachable, maintainable. And with the summer pruning right now, like I said, even though it's hot, if you get out there early and make it happen, it's really well worth the effort because you can bring down that size of the tree uh, and make it just more manageable. So summer pruning of your fruit trees can be done right now, and that's something to consider. And I'm telling you, if you have a backyard orchard and you, you're, you're treating like, whoa, they're so big, almost too, too big, this is a great time to kind of bring okay. them down to size. Nice. Yeah, we've definitely heard that uh, we've had episodes on citrus trees. We've talked to Ed Livo, and he was a big oh, yeah. proponent for summer pruning. So it's cool to hear now that now's the time. Yeah, this Ed is Livo's it. awesome with the backyard orchard culture. Uh, there's there's some people who truly believe in it. I love it. Um, I think when I first started the school garden, I didn't do enough of this, hmm. um, where I was letting my trees just get really you know massive. Uh, but it's now that I'm bringing them down to size, I've noticed it's just so much easier. It looks really nice. And then we can pack more in. So it's it's kind of fun. So there's a lot of benefits to it for sure. That's great. Well, um, that is time for this week. Thank you, Kevin, for your summer uh, tips and advice for this week. Now we're in July. We're... Uh, we've been struggling with all this heat oh, yeah. and, um, yeah, it's funny. You're like, uh, we don't, you're sick of hearing about it almost, but it's important that we are looking after our crops. Right? For sure. Yeah. We, we did all this effort in the spring. We want to continue that harvest. Don't give up now. Like I said, I, it was so hot earlier in the week and last week and I was a little under the weather. So when I finally got better, I'm like, I got to get in that garden. And once I did, I was like, oh, I'm so glad I'm here because yeah. everything is still looking good, even with the heat. So just just keep doing what you're doing or correct any mistakes you might be making uh, and just keep after it because the summer is going to go on. Our plants are going to continue to grow and there's so much more harvesting and enjoyment to be had. So hopefully our listeners are staying positive, optimistic and just having a great, a great time of it. Um, 
everything doesn't always work out the way we want to, but sometimes things just work out the way they should. Uh, everything's a learning experience when it comes to growing and gardening and cultivating. So I hope people are having fun, but also learning. And so uh, and with that in mind, it's like I wanted to bring up as, as a joke. I had a friend hit me up today, Austin. Yeah. And he, he tried to invite me to go do a triathlon oh, in like a week and a half. <laughs> Without training for it? Yes. And I was like, what a, What about our I, – I, 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 what makes you think I want to do this? <laughs> yeah, I, I had to just laugh as well. But but you know what? My hat's off to him and other people who want to do that. Uh, that's incredible. Maybe someday. Hey, but next year. Yeah, maybe next year. Maybe next year, buddy. <laughs> I go, I, I got to be in the garden. If I'm going to be – if I'm going to be sweating, it's going to be in my there garden harvesting go. and getting after it. So uh, I hope all of our listeners are having fun, staying hydrated, and just connecting with other people. Yeah. Uh, if you if you don't you don't have to garden on an island. You can learn from others. You can share what you know, um, and there's there's plenty to share and plenty to learn. I could tell you've been in the garden. You came in today, and I could see streaks of oh, sunscreen. Sun, oh, dude, I'm sunblocked all up. over your face. I use I use my child's sunblock now, which is basically just like white clay, <laughs> uh, and I think it helps. Um, but of course, you know, a straw good. hat as well. Yeah, taking um, care of your skin. Another great week, a fantastic trip, uh, lovely people at that conference. So my hat's off to the National Agriculture in the Classroom folks, as well as the California Foundation for Agriculture in the Classroom. We got to get more people gardening um, at any and all ages. So let's start them young, start, start them at every age, and it's never too late to start gardening. So until next week, garden friends, uh, my name's Kevin Jordan, the Cultivator Kid, wishing you a fantastic week out in your gardens and in your lives. Go have fun, enjoy yourselves, and happy gardening to you all. And please, never stop growing. growing.